الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين ومن استنى بسنته واقتفى أثره إلى يوم الدين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to a new episode of uh, this series um, Ramadan Refresher that we are having at the beginning of Ramadan this year inshallah to sort of remind ourselves of the rulings and etiquettes that pertain to uh, the month of Ramadan and the great act of worship, uh, Siyam, the fast of this blessed month of Ramadan. So we have uh, we have come to this uh, section in Riyad al-Salihin that is titled Babu al-Judi wa fi'li al-Ma'roof wal-Ikthari min al-Khayri fi shahri Ramadan wa ziyadati min thalika fi al-Ashri al-Awakhiri minhu this is a section on the uh, generosity and doing uh, good deeds and increasing in worship during the month of Ramadan and uh, specifically giving more or doing more during the last 10 days uh, or the last 10 nights of Ramadan. وعن ابن عباس رضي الله عنهما قال كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أجود الناس وكان أجود ما يكون في رمضان حين يلقاه جبريل وكان جبريل يلقاه في كل ليلة من رمضان فيدارسه القرآن فلرسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم حين يلقاه جبريل أجود بالخير من الريح المرسلة متفق عليه So this is collected by Al-Bukhari and Muslim from Ibn Abbas رضي الله عنهما He said that Allah's Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم was the most generous of people and he was the well, he was the most generous during Ramadan when he met Jibreel alayhi salam and the Prophet used to meet Jibreel alayhi salam to recite the Quran to him. And he says uh, Jibreel used to meet the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam every night to study the Quran with him. And the and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam when he met Jibreel he would be the most generous and he would be um, like he would give the most just like and he would give an an, um, an analogy here that the Prophet would be like the wind that was sent with rain that is so generous and has a lot of goodness in it second hadith is from Aisha وعن عائشة رضي الله عنها قالت كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا دخل العشر أحيا الليل وأيقظ أهله وشد المئزر so this muttafaqun alayhi collected by al-Bukhari and Muslim on the authority of Aisha radiyallahu anha she said the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam when the last 10 nights of Ramadan entered he would um, revive the night and that means that he would stay up the night and it seems that all of the night or at least would be most of it the pro and and we we're going to talk about what that actually means and he would wake up his uh, wives and he would exert himself so these are two hadith under this heading let's see what they actually mean so the first hadith is from Ibn Abbas عنhuma, that the Prophet ﷺ was the most generous of all of humans and we know this from the life of the Prophet وسلم, that every time he received or he received his share and many times it was a huge amount of money the Prophet ﷺ would just give it away he would distribute it he would hand it over to people especially those who are poor or those who are uh, close to accepting Islam and those who just recently accepted Islam and the Prophet ﷺ would spend it that's how the Prophet ﷺ spent his life and he would make the dua Allahumma ja'al rizqa ali Muhammadin kafafa or Allah make the provision uh, of uh, the household of Muhammad وسلم, only enough for them to survive that's what the Prophet ﷺ kept to himself Any, anything else he received he would spend it on the people in need poorer people and in many uh, ways uh, that were uh, considered to be ways of good spending 
So that's the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Messenger of Sallam would be more generous in Ramadan. So he was the most generous, but he would go the extra mile in Ramadan to be even more generous. And that's when he met Jibreel Alayhi Salam. So we know here from this hadith that every night the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would meet Jibreel in Ramadan. And they would study the Quran or revise the Quran together. And this shows that the nights of Ramadan are made for the Quran, either in Salat al Taraweeh or in recitation. And generally speaking, the nights are made for dhikrillah uh, azza wa jal, the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this shows that meeting Jibreel alayhi salam would have an impact on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is something that has to do with the nature of humans, because the scholars say humans are made of two elements. There is the physical elements, uh, the worldly elements, which is more like, uh, uh, more of an animalistic, bestial side of humans, right? So we share this with, with all other creatures, uh, the animals in, in, in this world. We have the physical body, we have the desire for food, for drink, uh, for copulating, and so on and so forth. So we share this, and, and with the instinct of survival, we have this shared aspect with animals. But we humans have another element that the animals do not have, and this is the spiritual side, which is the angelic, the angel-like part of who we are. And this is basically where Iman comes from, and this is where faith is, and this is what the heart really has to do. Uh, this is what the, the heart really is about. So the, the heart is mainly... I would say the, the, it's the battlefield, it's the area of competition between our bestial animalistic side and the angelic side, the spiritual side of who we are. And we are supposed to get the spiritual side or the soul uh, and this angelic side more in charge of us, uh, whereas the animalistic side is part of our life, but it should not be the leading component or element in our lives. So this shows that the Prophet is spending more time with Jibreel alayhi salam, he's become more generous and all of the, all of good traits, all of good um, characteristics of humans, the moral aspects of generosity, uh, love, forgiveness, kindness, uh, justice, all of those are actually, they are a function of our spiritual element. So the Prophet this shows that the spiritual element of the Prophet would be heightened even to a higher level after you know being spending time with Jibreel alayhi salam. So what does this hadith tell us? It tells us that following the, following the example of the Prophet a believer or a Muslim should actually increase in good. And this this kind of good that we we are supposed to, to, supposed to increase in comes from the soul it should come from the heart again it's not just a matter of uh, physical performance of any deed and that we just do merely uh, by way of willpower it's much more than that it is something it's more of a it should come as a translation of our spiritual growth this is this is our external action act, actions should actually be they are a demonstration of an inner growth in our souls in our faith and in our hearts. The second hadith is from Aisha radiallahu anha and this basically um, uh, it, it sort of um, makes the last 10 nights stand out. The last 10 nights is where Laylatul Qadr is expected to be or is actually it is one of the last 10 nights and this the Prophet used to like exert himself even more in the last 10 nights. Uh, so he would revive the night. What does this mean? He would do acts of worship. What are these acts of worship? It could be the prayer, Salat al-Taraweeh. It could be remembrance of Allah. Just remembering Allah, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar. And again, this is not limited to the words. It's not mere pronunciation. This is something that is supposed to be in the heart. So your tongue is mentioning Allah, but your heart is connecting to Allah. That's what it means. So this is more of a a state of calm and peace and tranquility where a person digs in, into their heart, where a person brings their spiritual nature more to the surface. Um, because we connect to Allah through our hearts, through our souls, not with our minds, not with our intellect. And thus, when when we engage in dhikr, our hearts, our spiritual nature is supposed to dominate. And... Uh, and thus mean, this means basically 
some level, a great level of disengagement from the physical world. So we sort of let again this spiritual side of us dominate and, and, and run the scene. And uh, we sort of just flow with it in that sense. It's a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's not merely the tongue that is speaking because when your heart is absent minded, that's not what dhikr is. Some people say, SubhanAllah, 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 and they're thinking about you know, they're, what they're going to do tomorrow. Or they're thinking about a problem they had, they had with, uh, with another person. Or they think about their obligations, or they think about their commitments, or they think about their financial situation. Or they think about work, or they think about anything else, something they read or a video that they watched. That's not dhikr. Dhikr is that the tongue is more of a precursor for your heart, but your heart is connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's what dhikr is. What else can you do in order to revive the night? Quran, recitation of the Quran. And this is a form of dhikr, one of the greatest forms of dhikr, that you recite the Quran. And since Ramadan is the month, of the Quran, then it makes so much sense that the nights of Ramadan are spent in reciting the Quran during the Salah and outside of the Salah. So you recite the Quran. Anything else that you can do, some people might, you know, have a certain limit, like they can recite, let's say, 10 pages and then they, they don't connect with it. They might want to push themselves a little bit more uh, in order to, again, push against the boundaries, uh, go beyond their comfort zone a little bit. Uh, they should do that, but then afterwards, maybe they should, they can, if they find reading tafsir or uh, taking a couple of verses and reflecting deeply on contemplating their meanings at a deeper level, if that helps them, then they should do that. Again, just be wise, be wise. Um, sense yourself out, see exactly where your heart really, what, what your heart enjoys the most and can sustain and can do for a prolonged period of time. This is what you need to do. This is what you need to focus on. Sort of read yourself in this sense. Um, so, yeah, and the Prophet would not only do that himself, like uh, revive the night, uh, bring it to life, but he would also wake up his family members. So this is such a great opportunity. This is such a great time. And the Prophet does not want to limit that to himself. So he would wake up his wives and he would let them, again, either do the kir, or recite Quran or pray. And again, sometimes uh, uh, sisters ask the question, is that sometimes a sister is having her period and I can't pray? Uh, well, you can recite Quran, you can read Quran. And I know there is a disagreement among scholars there, but the opinion that I myself adopt is the opinion of the scholars who say, you can actually recite the Quran. Well, avoid to hold the Quran in your own hands, uh, specifically. Uh, what you can we and today alhamdulillah we have we have a way out of this which is you can actually have the app uh, a quran app on your on your phone or your ipad and you can recite from it uh, because the rulings of the of holding the quran does not apply to your phone even when you have a quran as an app there so you can actually hold that and you can recite you can do dhikr you can do istighfar astaghfirullah 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 anything that connects you to allah anything any act of worship that brings you closer to allah and you can do more of it that's what you that's what you do again it doesn't have to be one specific thing um and and here since we we brought this issue of some uh especially the mothers when because they they a lot of them are busy with their kids sometimes through the day and maybe they're preparing food, they're preparing sahur, the pre-dawn meal, etc. for the family. And they, they find that their, their, their energy gets consumed with these tasks. And when it comes to the night, they can't do much and they just need to go to sleep. Again, what we, what we say, even if you do very little, like 5-10 minutes and you do that from your heart, that would be a great thing. And don't forget that the fact that you are taking care of your family, the fact that you are cooking the food and you're feeding your own family and you're helping them fast, you're preparing the pre-dawn meal for them. This is something that doesn't go unnoticed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is such a great act of worship. This is a great act of devotion and selflessness. And, and, and don't think Allah is going to let that go without great reward. Again, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's no way to lose as, as long as you are actually doing things sincerely and you have a pure heart. You can't lose with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And don't think Allah, Allah is someone who's going to discredit what you do or not reward you for the great things you do 
or that Allah wants you to pray when you're actually burnt out throughout the day uh, looking after your family and your kids and preparing food and doing different things don't think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to say oh I'm not going to reward you because you have not prayed to taraweeh to rak'ah taraweeh for me that's not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah is the most merciful as long as you give Allah your best you know expect, expect way more than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, Every person, sometimes every person's way to Allah could be unique and different. So for some people, Allah just opened the gate of the Quran for them. You find them reciting the Quran and they never get bored of it and they never grow impatient with it. This is something that Allah has given us, uh, has given them. But maybe Allah has given you something else. Maybe for some people, Allah has given them the dhikr and they can do hours of it and they can do it deep from their heart. That the, that the first person cannot actually match them at that, when it comes to this thing. For some people, it might be just the help and sacrifice. There are volunteers, there are charities now that are giving away food and, and providing meals for people, for families, for, for those who are in need, especially in these times of lockdown, when people have lost their jobs and people are unable to work. This is such a great thing. And the Prophet ﷺ, we say, we have just quoted the hadith of the Prophet when he was the most generous. So whatever you are generous with, any type of good deed that Allah loves, and that Allah has facilitated that for you, consider this to be your qiyam, consider this to be your devotion, consider this to be your, uh, the, the act of worship that you offer Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and expect much from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as long as you are doing things sincerely for the sake of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have here uh, an, another section that says Babu Nahi anta qaddumi Ramadan bisawmi bisawmi ba'da nisfi sha'ban illa liman wasalahu biman qablahu awafaka adata lahu bi ankana adatuhu sawmu al ithnaini wal khamis fawafaka. This is a section or a heading on uh, prohibition or advising against uh, fasting before Ramadan during the month of Sha'ban. And this is well. This should have been before Ramadan, but since it's here, we're just going to talk about it. Um, so, uh, advising not to fast before Ramadan during the month of Sha'ban, especially the last half of the month of Sha'ban, except for someone who had the habit, someone whose habit was, or their, their practice, the regular practice, was actually to... Uh, to, to fast regularly. So fast, let's say, for example, I'm just going to charge my phone. Let's charge the laptop. All right, yeah. So, except for someone whose habit or their daily practice, their, their regular practice has been, you know, observing the fast regularly, then they can, they can keep that. But for someone who has not uh, had the habit of fasting due, throughout the year, uh, then they just want to fast before Ramadan. Uh, so Imam uh, Anawi here is uh, having this heading or this section that it should not be the case. And again, but this is a matter of disagreement among scholars. It is a matter of disagreement among scholars. Uh, so let's just uh, uh, talk about this dispute before we move on to the hadith. So there is quite a quite a disagreement among scholars that a person who's not used to fasting throughout the year should they uh, come to the when it when it's the middle of Sha'ban the month of Sha'ban which comes before Ramadan should they can they uh, you know start fasting or should they stop or abstain from fasting until Ramadan comes some scholars say yeah, they should abstain if it was not their regular practice but some scholars say no not really it should not be uh, they can actually fast but uh, yeah they sh they can actually fast that's what that's what they say so let's come to the hadith here an abi hurairah radiyallahu anhu an an nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam qaal la yataqaddamanna ahadukum ramadan bi sawm yawm aw yawmayn illa an yakuna rajulun kana yasum sawmahu fal yasum dhalik al yawm muttafaq alayhi so collected by bukhari and muslim from abu hurairah radiyallahu anhu that the Prophet ﷺ said, let no one fast a day or two days before Ramadan. Except if it's a person who had the regular practice of fasting and it happens to be like the person uh, and it happens to be their regular day of fast and it happened to be one or two days before Ramadan, they can fast it. Like someone who fasts every 
Monday and Thursday and it, and like this year Ramadan the first day of Ramadan was uh, Friday so uh, should this person fast Thursday or not yes since it's their regular practice they can fast it no worries but if someone who doesn't have this habit of fasting should they fast the day before uh, Ramadan just like that there is the Prophet is saying it should not be the case وعن ابن عباس رضي الله عنهما قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لا تصوموا قبل رمضان صوموا لرؤيته وأفطروا لرؤيته فإن حالت دونه غياية فأكملوا ثلاثين يوم رواه الترمذي وقال حديث حسن صحيح الغياية بالغين المعجمة وبالياء المثنى من تحت المكررة من تحت المكررة وهي السحابة Okay, so this is from Ibn Abbas عنhuma, that he said, Allah's Messenger وسلم, said, do not fast before Ramadan. And again, this is in line with the hadith, just the one that came before, which is a day or two before that. Uh, fast for sighting the moon and stop fasting at the end of the month for, fast, for seeing or sighting the moon. And if there is a cloud, if it's cloudy, then you complete the month, the, the, lunar, the lunar month is 30 days. This is collected by at Tirmidhi. All right, and uh, this, is, this hadith from uh, Abu Huraira and Abu Huraira رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا بقي نصف من شعبان فلا تصوموا رواه الترمذي وقال حديث حسن صحيح. So this hadith is collected uh, by Tirmidhi. It's on the authority of Abu Huraira that Allah's Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم said if it's the last half or the second half of شعبان do not fast. Collected by Tirmidhi. Uh, this hadith, I just have to point out that there is a dispute among the scholars of hadith whether this hadith is authentic or not. So there is a debate. So some scholars say it is authentic and thus they, they say do not fast the second half of Ramadan unless you have a regular practice because the other hadith points out that. Um, but if you don't have a regular practice of fasting, then you do not fast the second half of Sha'ban unless you started before that, before the uh, the middle of Sha'ban. The scholars who say, no, this is not an authentic hadith, uh, they say basically, uh, no, you can still fast. But again, avoid the last uh, one or two days of uh, Sha'ban. Uh, and even some of the scholars who consider this hadith to be sahih, they say it's more of a recommendation, but not a prohibition. A recommendation not to fast the second half of Sha'ban if it's not your habit. Okay, so we have this dispute among these scholars. There is this kind of dispute. Uh, I take the opinion that um, of the scholars who say that it is okay to fast after the middle of Sha'ban, even if you don't have a regular practice, but avoid the last day or the last two days of Sha'ban if you don't have the habit of fasting. We have this hadith وعن أبي اليقظان عمار بن ياسر رضي الله عنهما قال من صام اليوم الذي يشك فيه فقد عصى أبا القاسم صلى الله عليه وسلم رواه أبو داود والترمذي وقال حديث حسن صحيح collected by أبو داود والترمذي from عمار بن ياسر رضي الله عنهما that the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم that he said عمار بن ياسر said whoever fasts the day of doubt and, and this is, the day of doubt is usually the 30th day of Sha'ban because some people say, oh no, the, today is Ramadan. Uh, others say, no, no, it's tomorrow's Ramadan. Just like, so this was the uh, day of Thursday. This year here, it was Thursday. It's the 30th day of Sha'ban because there's usually a dispute. Sometimes Some people see the moon, some people don't sight the moon. And if the moon is not sighted, and some people say, well, maybe it was there, but people missed it. Let me just fast it out of precaution. That's what the Prophet ﷺ prohibited. Because we have a hadith, and probably maybe it will come, that the Prophet ﷺ said, صوموا لرؤيته وافطروا لرؤيته وصوموا يوم تصومون والفطر يوم تفطرون The Prophet ﷺ said, fast when you sight the moon, and break the fast in Ramadan when you, fast, when you sight the moon. And he also said that, uh, Ramadan starts when you start it as the group, the community of the Muslims, the nation. Or if there's a government, it's when the government starts. And uh, Ramadan ends when all of you uh, 
agree that it has it has ended. So basically, when the the community uh, announces that it is the end of Ramadan, so if someone says, "No, I want to fast the day out of precaution before before the day of Ramadan." Um, he, this great companion Amr ibn Yasser says this person has disobeyed Abu Qasim who is the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that this is against the instructions of the Messenger alayhi salatu wassalam alright Let's move on. Uh, we have time for this. For this number of hadith on uh, suhoor, the pre-dawn meal. So this is a section. Babu fadli as-suhoor wa ta'khirihi liman lam yakhsha tulu al-fajri. This is a section on the merit and the importance of uh, taking the pre-dawn meal and delaying it, keeping it till the late last. Uh, uh, the last part of the night as long as the person does not fear that it is fajr time and anas radiyallahu anhu qala qala rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tasahharu fa inna fi suhuri baraka muttafaqun alayhi collected by al-bukhari muslim anas radiyallahu anhu says allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said uh, take the pre-dawn meal suhoor there is blessings there is blessings in it. It's a blessed meal. وعن زيد بن ثابت رضي الله عنه قال تسحرنا مع رسول الله مع رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ثم قمنا إلى الصلاة قيل كم كان بينهما قال قدر خمسين آية متفق عليه. This is collected by Bukhari and Muslim as well from Zayd ibn Thabit رضي الله عنه. He said we ate the pre-dawn meal with the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم. Then we uh, rose for the prayer, meaning Al Fajr, Salat Al Fajr. So he was asked, How much time was between the pre dawn meal and um, the prayer, Salat Al Fajr? He said, uh, The time that it would take to recite 50 verses. And generally speaking, when the companions uh, used the verses, 50 verses or 100 verses, as uh, a gauge for timing, they would usually refer to the shortest verses like Surah al dhariyat like Surah Al-Mursalat, like Surah Al-Najm, where the verse is actually two words or three words. So that's what, what it is. Uh, so roughly speaking, I'm just giving an, a rough estimate. Um, we're talking about maximum 10 minutes, maximum 10 minutes. وعن ابن عمر رضي الله عنهما قال كان لرسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم مؤذنان بلال وابن أمي مكتوم يس بلال وابن أمي مكتوم فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إن بلالا يؤذن بليل فكلوا واشربوا حتى يؤذن ابن أمي مكتوم قال ولم يكن بينهما إلا أن ينزل هذا ويرقى هذا متفق عليه collected by Bukhari and Muslim as well from Ibn Umar رضي الله عنهما he said Allah's messenger or the Prophet or the messenger had two people to call the Adhan it was Bilal and Ibn Umi Maktum Abdullah Ibn Umi Maktum the messenger said that Bilal calls his Adhan because there were two Adhans for Fajr, one before Fajr and one at the time of Fajr. So the Prophet Bilal used to call the Adhan first. And the Prophet says Bilal calls his Adhan during the night, meaning it's not Fajr time. This is an Adhan to remind people to wake people up before the actual Adhan of Fajr. And also for those who are fasting, uh, so that for them to eat before uh, Fajr. That Bilal calls his Adhan during the night. So eat and drink until Ibn Ummi Maktoum calls the Adhan. Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum makes the second Adhan, that's the Adhan for Fajr. So now you should stop eating and drinking when you hear that Adhan. And uh, Abdullah ibn Umar said, and the time between the Adhan of Bilal and the Adhan of Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum uh, was only enough 
that Bilal climbs down from the high spot where he used to call the Adhan and then Abdullah ibn Umi Maktoum climbs up. So it's not a long time. It's not, it's actually, a few, it's talking about a few minutes. Um, and again, this shows that the Muslims, obviously they didn't have clocks at the time. They would just eat, eat until the Adhan is called and they would stop eating. They would stop eating when the Adhan is called. Uh, and uh, okay, we'll come to, there is a ruling specifically about this. So we're going to come to that later on in the future, inshallah. وعن عمر بن العاص رضي الله عنه أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال فصل ما بين صيامنا وصيام أهل الكتاب أكلة السحر رواه مسلم collected by Muslim from عمر بن العاص رضي الله عنه that Allah's Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم said the difference between our fast and the fast of the people of the scripture is the pre-dawn meal so this is all about السحور and just to um, point out, is it suhoor or sahur? Suhoor is the is the actual action of engagement with food. It's the act itself. Sahur is the food that is prepared for the pre-dawn meal. So suhoor is the actual eating, the act of eating and having the meal. Sahur is the food that is prepared for the pre-dawn meal. Pre-dawn meal. So the lesson here is that the Prophet ﷺ encouraged strongly having the uh, suhoor, the pre-dawn meal, because it did, and he said it's barakah, it's a blessing, and it helps uh, the fasting person engage with the fast and uh, you know handle it well. Uh, and uh, it is something the Prophet ﷺ used to practice, and it's something that sets apart the fast of the Muslims from the fast of others. So, so it's a great etiquette that we should observe as we are fasting. And when you take your pre-dawn meal, do it with the intention that you are following the advice of the Prophet Sallallahu And thus you eat and you're getting reward. Bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. Again, Jazakumullah khairan for joining us. We ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to accept our fast and our acts of worship and uh, to help us do more in a way that pleases Him. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een.